you voted. Our folks on Patreon have voted. It was actually pretty close between the top two. I gave four different options. You can see the poll right there. And the choice was the South Sea Bubble. So we're going to go ahead and dive into back into extra history once again. The South Sea Bubble. Now, I don't know a lot of details about this event. I, I know the basics. I know kind of the, the broad strokes of history. I know there's a lot of government corruption involved here. I know this was done as a way of kind of propping up the uh, national debt. Uh, that this takes place in kind of the early um, 18th century. Uh, this is one of those joint stock company operations, kind of like the East India Company. Uh, beyond that, I don't really know the details. So I'm excited to learn. And uh, I'm excited that you're going to be along with me for this journey as we learn. Uh, this series is going to take us right up to my trip to Antietam next week. So I'm probably going to have to record a couple of episodes ahead so that this whole series can run uninterrupted. And the last couple of episodes will probably go up while I am in uh, Maryland. So join me as we dive into the South Sea Bubble. As always, the link is in the description to the original content. Please uh, give them a like and subscribe to Extra History. Extra Credits is the name of the channel. Uh, and they have other topics besides history. That's why we call it Extra History, because it's the Extra Credits History. Anyway, let's dive in. Welcome to the fourth installment of Extra History. This time it's going to be a daring tale of high seas, adventure, and romance. Nah, I'm just kidding. This is going to be all about finance and economics. So this is pretty fascinating, because if you're starting a new thing, right... Uh, this is, must be one of their earliest videos they did if it's their fourth installment. Uh, you'd think you'd hit the highlights, right? You'd hit the big events. World War II, the American Civil War, uh, presidents, you know, different topics that you think are going to appeal to a, a, a wide English-speaking audience. They go right into finance and a little-known thing. So this kind of sets the tone a little bit for what they're all about. And I love that this was such an early thing that they did. First off, I just want to say, I think it's amazing that we get to do this episode. Each month, the Patreon subscribers vote on what the next topic is going to be. And last month, we just sort of threw in the South Seas Company topic on a lark. It's important, and it's relevant, but we figured there's no way that it would win out against things like the life of Caesar or the Spanish Inquisition. But delightfully, we were wrong. And that's one of the things that I love that's about cool. doing this series. Everything from the YouTube comments to the episode suggestions and the votes from the Patreon supporters reflect not the nihilistic internet that people always talk about, but rather a genuine curiosity and a love of history. And, you know, I just got to stop and comment there, too, and say the same thing about our community here on YouTube. Is it perfect? No, because no collection of 314,000 people is going to be perfect. We've got people from all over the world on this channel. But listen, probably 313,800 of the people who are subscribed to this channel are just phenomenal. You know, we've got a few here and there, but that's just part of life. But I would say, by and large, as a community on the Internet goes... You guys are phenomenal. Uh, I love our conversations. Even when we disagree, when we debate, we do so in a pretty healthy way. Uh, and most people just kind of ignore the people who just want to be idiots because there's so few of them anyway. Uh, and I've said this many times, one of the unexpected joys I have in this channel that I had no idea would be such an important thing to me when I started it was how much I would love this community and getting to know all of you guys. So it's been great. I desperately want to cover the campaigns of Caesar and dig into the truth about the Spanish Inquisition too, of course. But I think it's pretty awesome that we have an audience that's also interested in something as obscure and esoteric as the South Seas Bubble. So, what is the South Seas Bubble? It is perhaps some of the wildest financial chicanery of the 18th century. And why are we covering it? Well, because it has a lot of parallels with mm. some of the events of the last few years. We talk all the time. History doesn't repeat itself necessarily, but it rhymes. And you can always see parallels. You hear me make parallels all the time, especially if it's a topic I don't know a lot about. I'll try to find parallels in other parts of history that I do know about just to show you how often history really does rhyme. And, you know, we've seen just in the last couple of decades, there was a huge housing bubble here in the United States. Uh, and there's other bubbles. There's the tech bubble that happened. You know, um, industries or companies or just financial systems that grow uh, 
for reasons that are not based in solid foundations and inevitably they, we call those bubbles because inevitably they burst and come back down to earth um you know another one could be an example of like the um all the uh, cryptocurrency right now who knows what's going to happen with that it gloriously highlights the importance and value of financial institutions while also serving as a warning about the incredible danger of invented wealth but before we can talk about the South Seas bubble, we have to talk about the South Seas Company. And before we can talk about the South Seas Company, we have to talk about Great Britain in the early 1700s. Back to the roots. First off, there was no Great Britain in the very early 1700s, because until the Act of Union in 1707, England and Scotland were two different countries. So background, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but 1603, Queen Elizabeth I of England dies. Uh, her heir and nearest relative to inherit the throne has to go back to her. Uh, so Queen Elizabeth is the daughter of Henry VIII, who's the son of Henry VII, who was the first monarch of the Tudor dynasty. Henry VII has four children who grow to at least teenage years. His son Arthur, who was supposed to be king but dies young, uh, dies at 16. His second son is Henry, who's the Duke of York, who becomes king of England. And then he has two daughters. Uh, one of those daughters marries the king of France, and one of those daughters marries the king of Scotland, James IV. The daughter, I think Margaret, uh, marries the king of Scotland, and then their child is James V. Uh, James V has a daughter, Mary, Queen of Scots, and then Mary, Queen of Scots, has a son, James, who is James VI of Scotland. And so when Queen Elizabeth dies, James VI, uh, who is her grandfather, uh, her yeah, her grandfather's um great grandson great great grandson um anyway james is the nearest heir and so he who is already king of scotland inherits the throne of england and so now you have two separate countries with two separate governments under the same crown but they're still separate until the act of union merges them into great britain so at that point you've got scotland wales and england are all one nation. Great Britain is that island, and it's only later on in the 19th century you're going to get the United Kingdom, uh, which adds Ireland to the mix. And then, of course, in the 20th century, Ireland leaves, but Northern Ireland stays. So today we have the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But since that's right in the middle of the story that we're about to tell, I'm just going to refer to England as Great Britain throughout, if that's okay. And the first thing to know about our Great Britain is the fact that in the late 17th and early 18th century, it pretty much could not get enough of being at war. Not only did the English go through a major civil war in the 17th century, which I am sure we're going to cover someday, but then they just continued to fight pretty much everybody in Europe for the next 100 years. So with that in mind, I'm just going to start us off in 1710 with a guy named Robert Harley. August of 1710 looks like it's going to be a great month for Mr. Harley. Through a bunch of political wrangling, he's just gotten himself appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer, a position that's basically the same as the Secretary of the Treasury in the U.S. Now, here's the only thing. Minor quibble. It says E.R. Uh, Elizabeth Regina, I think it is, uh, which, which is the symbol you see. Uh, usually it's E.R. with a 2. Um for the symbol of Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, but of course, in 1710, it's not Elizabeth who's the queen, but minor thing. He's been out of power for a while, but by gum, he's gotten himself back in it now. He's thinking everything is going to be great. Then he looks at Britain's balance sheet. In one column is the 5,000 pounds still remaining in the government treasury. And in the other column is a hastily scrawled note saying somewhere roughly probably around 9 million pounds in big red ink. To give you an idea of just how big this debt is, the current, yes, current Chancellor of the Exchequer announced that a payment toward this consolidated debt will be made on February 1st of 2015. That red ink is still being paid down today, 300 years later. You have 5,000 pounds in the treasury and you're 9 million in debt. Uh, let's put that in perspective a little bit. Um, you know, even for the average person, uh, let's say that you make, well, I don't know. Let's move on for now. So with that in mind, you can pretty much imagine the freakout that Harley had when he realized just how impossible his job was. His first task was just to keep the government afloat through the end of the year. Unfortunately, there were a few hurdles between him and doing that. First, there was the problem of government accounting. 
At the time, Britain had no unified budget, so while everybody knew that they were in debt, until Harley did a thorough investigation, no one quite knew exactly how in debt they were. You know, a lot of people function like this today, right? They just kind of pay their bills, uh, and they have money coming in, and if there's enough money in there, then they'll pay the bills. They don't really budget, they don't really plan. And I'm telling you right now, not a good way to live. Uh, I don't want to get too much sounding like Dave Ramsey, but uh, I'm a big fan of Dave, Dave Ramsey and his budget budgeting system. And it's something my wife and I have used over the years. But man, make a budget. Know where your money's coming from. Know where it's going to. Have a plan. This meant that no real preparation had been done, and since every government department had its own budget and carried its own debts, even after doing a deep dive on the books, even Harley could only give a ballpark estimate of how much debt they really had to tackle. Second problem, the House of Commons was a deeply partisan two-party body. For the last few years, the Parliament had been controlled by the Liberal Whigs, with the Conservative Tory minority routinely blocking any legislation from the opposite side of the House. Well, now the Tories had come into power, and you better believe the Whig minority was going to do the same thing to them. Of course, in response, the Tories were busy calling for the impeachment of members of the previous Whig government, and all of this just made raising taxes a near impossibility. With taxation as a revenue stream cut off, Harley turned to the next viable option to keep the government running, the Bank of England. So, again, context. Uh, I'm sure it's the same way right now uh, in the UK, but here in the United States, very difficult to get anything done when the party in power has a very strong opposition party that kind of kills everything they try to do. And it happens in both parties. You know, the Democrats do it to the Republicans. The Republicans do it to the Democrats. There's nobody that is absolved of being a part of that problem. You know, there's very little of, hey, let's come together and figure out a way that we can come up with a plan that benefits the country regardless of who I, whose idea it is and, and how much it might help people. Um, yeah, so things have not really changed all that much in 300 years. The Bank of England, though, was created by the Whigs and was a Whig-controlled institution. In fact, this is the beginning of the age of central banking. The Bank of England was really the first institution of its kind, a bank specifically designed to lend money to the government and make sure the government remained solvent. But since most of the board members of the Bank of England were Whigs and Harley was a Tory, the bank was none too quick to help the government out. Right. So again, it's all about party politics, right? Even if it might help the country, even if it might be a good idea, it's people from the other side. So it's therefore inherently bad. We've got to find a way to get past that kind of a mindset. But I just don't know if it's going to happen because look how long it's been going on. This left only foreign creditors as a possible source of revenue for the government. But given how deeply in debt the government already was, and how many people it was still fighting, outside credit wasn't really available. So, with no other options left to him, Harley turned to less orthodox sources. Namely, John Blunt of the Hollow Sword Blade Company. Despite Blunt being an odd name for one of the fellows in charge of a company which held the monopoly on making fine swords, our Mr. Blunt possessed a sharp financial mind and very few, if any, scruples. None saw... or few scruples. In other words, he'll do whatever he has to do. The government's critical financial state, not as some great national crisis, but rather an opportunity to make money. Lots and lots of money. But he couldn't just sell the government rapiers. No, Blunt needed cold, hard cash. So he dreamed up a scheme so convoluted, it's kind of hard to even describe, but I'm going to give it my best shot. The real estate market in Ireland was currently up for grabs, as the British government had just confiscated large amounts of Catholic land. Blunt wanted the Hollow Sword Blade Company to buy as much as it could, as cheaply as possible. Unfortunately, the Hollow Sword Blade Company didn't quite have the capital to do that, so they needed to raise some money in a hurry. Normally, you would do this just by selling stock in the company, but Blunt had a much more intricate plan. He offered to trade stock in the Hollow Sword Blade Company for army debentures at under market value to anyone who was willing to make the swap. Now, army debentures were a form of government debt. Basically, they were a promissory note that the army issued when it couldn't afford to, you know, actually pay for things. The problem was, you can't exactly repossess the army's car, so those promissory notes aren't actually backed by anything. And this is, again, a debate that's going to happen for centuries is about issuing paper paper money in some cases or you know things like this that isn't backed by anything this is where you get extreme inflation but you also risk the possibility of collapse uh, something kind of along these lines uh, led to a lot of corruption in the early American government in the late part of this same century uh, when 
you have an American government that doesn't have a lot in the way of funds but needs to raise an army. They gave a lot of these guys who enlisted in the army um, basically kind of like promissory notes that they would be able to cash in after the government was established, after the government had the ability to pay it back. Well, there began to be fear in the early years of the American government that they weren't going to be able to pay it back. But there were certain men who had connections in the government who knew that the U.S. was going to be able to do that. But it wasn't made public yet. And so they go around to all of these, uh, these veterans and start offering them pennies on the dollar for these notes that they had, knowing they were going to be worth the full value in a short time. And it was, they called it speculation, but it was basically a way of just making a quick buck. So if I can give you, I'll give you 20 cents for that because it's better than getting nothing at all. Well, I just made 80 cents on it because I know that it's going to be fully backed by the government. Uh, and there was a lot of corruption because a lot of men knew that was happening. Uh, it, it was a mess. Making them very hard for people to collect on, which in turn made them nearly worthless. Okay, so at this point, you're probably confused. How is the Hollow Sword Blade Company going to make money by swapping shares in their company at under market value for army debt that most people are just looking to get rid of anyway? Well, Blunt realized that an offer this good was going to entice a lot of people into taking him up on it, thereby massively inflating the demand for, and thus the price of, army debentures. Yep. So he very quietly went out ahead of time and had the company quietly buy up as many army debentures as it possibly could before- Same kind of thing as what happens with the U.S. They're buying stuff that has low value now because they know it's about to have high value. Or announcing their offer to swap Insider debentures trading. for company shares. That way, when they announced their offer, the value of all the debentures they picked up would go through the roof. On top of that, because the land he was aiming to buy was government-held, he could trade the government debt for the land directly at whatever value he'd driven the debt to. This tangly web of financial magic ended up getting him not only the 200,000 pounds he needed to buy land in Ireland, but also another 20,000 pounds, which he politely loaned to the government at a very low rate. Now, what Blunt and the Hollow Sword Blade Company did here is certainly illegal today, and probably was illegal back then, too. In fact, there was even a court ruling against the company, but since they were now busy lending the government money, no action was ever taken against them. After all, when you're busy lending money to the government, who exactly is going to punish you for bending the law? Which is, of course, what got Blunt and Harley together in the first place. Blunt was helping the government find funds, and Harley badly needed funds to be found, so it was high time they take tea. The Bank of England had been running a rather mediocre lottery for the government the last few years, and Harley decided that Blunt was just the man he needed to kick it up a notch. So he got the rights to administer the government lottery turned over to Blunt and his crew. And man, did Blunt do a bang-up job. In four days, he sold out all of the tickets, pocketing a tidy profit for himself in the process. Of course. He then followed it up with an unbelievably exorbitant lottery with tickets that cost thousands of dollars apiece by today's standards. And he sold out all of those, too. The only problem was that part of the way he did this was by making sure that every ticket won something. At minimum, you were guaranteed to get at least 10% of the price of your ticket back in winnings, which is great for the gambler, but not so great for the government. The key, though, was that the government would pay out the winnings over the next decade uh -huh. rather than right away, bringing a much-needed influx of cash to the exchequer. It gives you a big influx of cash, but it doesn't guarantee that 10 years from now you're still going to have that cash to pay it back. This is all... Uh, I can already see where all of this is going, and it's not good. So while, yes, this added still more long-term debt the government owed, it gave Harley the 300,000 pounds kicking he the can needed down to the see road. the government through the next few months. But it's going to take way more than just lotteries to solve the larger looming debt crisis. So join us next time for the scheme that Harley and Blunt pulled together to tackle the long-term British debt. A so, scheme that will be called the South Seas Trading Company. So we're going to get into, I mean, this is, uh, if I remember right, it has to do with the slave trade, negotiating like exclusive rights with the Spanish. And um, yeah, it's just, I mean, this is just such an early picture of government corruption at its best uh, or worst, I guess you would say. But I'm excited to dive into this one. As uh, I often do with these series where we're talking about a topic that maybe not a lot of people know about. I know a lot of you guys have already seen this, but uh, if you're new to it, like I am, is there something you learned you didn't know before? Or is there something you can add to the conversation in the part we've already talked about? 
Uh, use the comment section below. Let's have a conversation. Let's learn from each other. As always, I do read every single comment. I don't always react. I don't always hit like. I don't always respond to it. But I do still read every single comment on every video. So know that if you leave a comment, I do see it. Uh, so thanks for watching, guys. And we will see you again soon.